the age that I started making music, well, um, I mean, I kind of grew up in a in a very music oriented family, as in, um, my dad used to like blast music while my mom was pregnant all the time, and then on top of that, I, my first concert I went to was when I was like two years old, and my dad took me to like a pot festival to see uh, Black Crows. And I mean, I don't even know why. And I can't say, like, I don't really remember it. Either either because it was a pop festival or because I was two years old. But, yeah, so, like, my, you know, my dad was always, like, blasting music all the time. And it was only until I was, like, nine years old when I really wanted to play an instrument. And I didn't know what I wanted to play. And I was like, what if I just, like, played saxophone? And my sister was like, that's so lame. You don't play saxophone. You just play, like, the drums or something. And I was like, all right. So I started playing drums. And I took it, like, way too seriously. And, you know, I was, like, you know, doing the concert band thing, playing all these bands. And I was, like, set on becoming a drummer, like a professional drummer. And then when I was 13, I started playing guitar. I started playing piano, even, like, xylophone. Um, just playing a lot of different instruments. And I was recording, in, like, with metal bands mostly, just because that's what I was into during high school. And so I started playing the drums for a lot of metal bands, started playing in jazz bands my later high school years. And, you know, I, I auditioned at a bunch of different universities in the Southeast to play drums, but I didn't get into any one of them because they thought, like, my groove was just, just too crazy. Like, as in, like, I was, like, I was really influenced by, like, Buddy Rich and Dennis Chambers, all the big jazz drummers that just go crazy and it's like totally free form and so I was like you know screw having a groove like I just want to do some crazy stuff and they hated that they hated it so I didn't make it on drums for university and as for like hip-hop music I'd always kind of been into like you know mainstream rap and new metal when I was growing up especially throughout middle school and then when I was like 13 you know I, I, I was like really engrossed into into like the new metal scene like corn and slipknot uh deftones lincoln park all of that i was, was a huge influence on like the kind of music i wanted to i wanted to make and so by the time i got to college um i i also started getting into indie hip-hop and i got a macbook and i was like oh sweet i'm gonna make some beats and they were awful they were so awful beats they were terrible I don't even know what I was thinking, and I was like recording through like the the computer mic and everything. And I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna make hip hop music and make all this stuff," and you know, it was just it was just so bad. And I I tried. I was also taking a songwriting class, and that was mostly based on acoustic pop music. So I was actually writing like acoustic pop ballads, and then writing hip hop beats, and thinking that I could combine the two somehow. And it ended up sounding awful because I didn't really combine them. I just like came out with this crappy demo album of acoustic pop music and electronic hip hop. And it was like the dumbest idea I'd ever thought of. But it was only until I was like 19 that I got the Bike for Three album, which was an electronic hip hop um, debut from my favorite rapper of all time, Buck65. And I was like, holy shit. This is what I want to do. This is exactly what I do. And if you haven't heard that album, you need to hear it. It is a it is like an underrated masterpiece of electronica hip hop. And so I just completely modeled myself after that and started like I got Logic Pro. I started making way better beats and just kind of mastering my flow and getting down what I wanted to to do with my music. I'm sorry, I keep looking out the window because it's like raining and I'm I might have to go outside later. But Anyway, so that, and that's what I wanted to do, and then I told people about it, and they were like, oh, you should check out, like, you know, these other, like, instrumentalists, like, Emancipator, and, like, from there, I, I found out, like, all this, like, trip-hop and instrumental hip-hop music, and uh, one of my best friends suggested I, I look at Emancipator, and I was like, hey, I could totally, like, write a rap to this. So I, I wrote a rap to Emancipator, one of Emancipator songs, I put it out on YouTube, and it just started like blowing up really, really quickly. And I was like, well, shit, I can keep doing this. So I was doing more trip hop, more hip hop kind of music, that, and like kind of subtle electronica. I got into glitch hop 
basically it was just getting like more hardcore, more hardcore to where someone was like, hey, you ever heard of Flux Pavilion? I think you'd sound really cool over dubstep. And I was like, no, this was like, this was like when Flux only had like, like maybe like 50,000 likes on his Facebook. Like he was, he was like only largely known for dubstep. And it was like right before Skrillex made his debut. And so I was like, I never heard of dubstep. I'll, I'll check it out. And I listened to it and I was like, this is amazing. How have I never heard this before? And so I was like, yeah, I'll try rapping over dubstep. So I, I rapped over one Flux beat and eventually, um, Flux found it and posted it on his Facebook, and he was like, well, this is weird. And, and then, like, some of his fans were like, oh, my God, this is awesome. So they came over to my YouTube, and they were like, oh, you need to rap over this and this and this and this dubstep song and this one. So it was like, this became an onslaught of, like, dubstep music requests coming at me, and I was like, yeah, I can do that one, I can do that one. And... And that's when like it started verging with what I was like combining, you know, trip hop and hip hop and dubstep and then, you know, people were asking me to do drum and bass. And so it was all this EDM music that I was just being drowned in from people just suggesting it to me. And I just kept rapping more and more while working on my own original music. And that's pretty much what I've been doing. And so I've kind of I've kind of like left the uh, Hip hop and trip hop community, and it's kind of sad, but I still listen to it like every day. It's just that you know most of the producers that approach me now are for dubstep and more electronic, like heavy electronic music, rather than the trip hop, hip hop that I used to do. So that's pretty much where I am at now, and just doing the EDM thing, and yeah. Oh yeah, I started off with GarageBand, and then I got Logic Pro 8, and most of the VSTs I used were the ones that just came with it, like ES2 and uh, Mono Bass, stuff like that. Um, I'm planning on getting a massive AU, I have yet to, because I just, I just know massive is the shit. And then I used an MPD-26. I used to literally only write my beats on the keyboard <laughs> all the time. Um, and let's see, I use an M I got an MPD-26. Um, I use I now use a Neumann TLM-102 mic. I used to have an Audio-Technica 4040 mic, and that was, like, so bad. I don't know why I had that. I literally had to polish that turd in my vocals, like, every single time it was just just don't get an audio technical mic just get a neumann mic it's just like the easiest to work with and then before that i had like a behringer b1 mic which wasn't that bad but you know you, you get what you pay for pretty much and so i think i've definitely progressed slowly in my tech usage for making music and i definitely plan on progressing more and more Not really. I don't. I that was kind of that's kind of a weird question because I've never actually. No one's ever like, oh yeah, this is me rapping. It's, but it's not, it's, and I I don't really put out a lot of instrumentals unless it's you know I I, I mostly label my instrumentals under Creative Commons because I don't mind people remixing my music or rapping over it or just putting it out whenever they want, um, as long as just credit is paid. But nobody's ever like uploaded my song and said, yeah, this is me. I did this. No, that's never happened. It's, 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 it's like, it's like already at the point where if you were to upload something like that and say it was you, people would just know that, uh, I think you're just kind of full of shit. That doesn't make any sense. So yeah, no, that's never happened to me. And I'm, I'm sure that will come up in the future for sure, but never has happened. DRM, I mean, I'm pretty sure didn't they get rid of that? I I'm pretty sure they got rid of it just because they realized how dumb it was. Because I remember uh, when I actually used to buy music on iTunes, um, they I they, I could share it with like five people only, and I'm just like, God, this is so dumb. Like it's 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 and like then you know that's when people would resort to uh, like like software that could hack into it and take the DRM off. 
it's it's just, it's just like pointless. Like DRM is is a, a dumb idea. Like why why would you limit something that can be infinitely copied? And if anything, DRM is is dumb unless you don't have any like friends that have good music. Then yeah, it's just I don't I don't know you know what they just don't they they don't they don't get it. <laughs> but yeah, I think they took that off now since they realized just how dumb it was. And that you have to kind of look at an MP3 download not as a product anymore because, you know, most products have finite ability, but an MP3 has, like, you know, infinite capability of being duplicated. It's like now you have to look at that as, like, the guy who hands out the flyer in front of, you know, in, in front in front of, like, venues and stores and stuff. Like, oh, oh, check this out. Check this out. You kind of, now that's the new view of an mp3 it's it's more for marketing and for promotion rather than just a uh, scarce uh, accessibility in order to enjoy it and make money off of it there's just there is no point at this age to think that you can uh, limit the access the accessibility to an mp3 when someone is going to find a way to make it uh, accessible for free there's just no point in fighting it so you might as well embrace it and, it, and I actually just did a study on how file sharing has affected musicians' income. And it's for newer popular artists and newer artists that are not popular at all. It actually, even with file sharing going on, it has actually increased their income. No matter what, it's just, it's, it's increased completely. Because if you think about it, if you become a musician, you're obviously going to make more money since you just became a musician. And you're just putting out your music. Maybe you get booked for a show, which is how most musicians make the most money. And then with the newer popular artists, it's like file sharing can still get your name out there completely if everyone's just like downloading it and putting it out there and showing their friends. But the only people that are getting you know screwed by file sharing is actually the the artists that were popular but are not anymore. Maybe like Limp Biscuit, just because a no one's heard, no none of the newer generations have heard of him. And they're not marketing and promoting him anymore. So I would say that there is no point to DRM at this age. I mean, that's that's it's kind of goes with the standard of business, though. That's when you have to think about that. It's it's like if if iTunes does obviously does not want to deal directly with artists, which I think is really dumb. But it's also it frees up a lot of their hassles and work to do if they're just dealing with the aggregators. And I mean that's that's just how business works. It's like if there's a demand for it, then someone's gonna find a way to make money off of it. So until they actually are able to create a whole new network to deal directly with artists, which is going to take a lot of time, and because that's not what they were intending in the first place. So it's going to be a complete innovation, and just uh, it's also going to eliminate some other businesses like TuneCore and CD Baby, a little bit of Reverb Nation. So and they have to think about that as well. And of course, those businesses are going to obviously have a conflict of interest. And they are not going to support iTunes dealing directly with artists. And the one thing I would say, I, I, I mean, I do it and I, and I support it, is simply being able to make your own website. Even if it's just a static HTML, and then just putting a PayPal link to download your music. If anything, that's what, you, that's what every artist should be directing their music towards. Because it's like, if you think about it, if people so people some are paying, you know, a PayPal fee to download your music, that's only like a 2% cut they take. iTunes takes 70%, and then there's a cut that the aggregator takes, and then you get that much left. And that's not even to say the, 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 the artists that are on record labels, and the record label takes a cut from there. So it's like, you know, what what is the point at that? Like, why would you think you want to make money at that point if you want to put it on iTunes? Why not just do it straight from you and just put it on your website? That's what I feel like made sense to me, and that's what I've literally been taught at my school. It's like, you know, don't think about having a middleman. iTunes, like, everyone keeps saying, why don't you put your stuff on iTunes? Why don't you put your stuff on iTunes? 
What difference would it make if you could download it from my website or download it from iTunes? It's, it's, it, it's still an MP3. You can still download it. Like, it doesn't, it, I don't know. Most people just say, ask me to put on iTunes because I can't release my remixes without the permission from the original copyright owner of that instrumental. I can't do that. And if I started doing that, my YouTube channel will probably be shut down immediately. So I have been avoiding that since day one because I know how bad it is to do that. Because I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I learned a music business, so I don't know. I have to, I have to pretty much work with a publishing company, a middleman, in order to actually clear all that. Because most of their publishing companies don't want to hear from me. They don't want to deal directly with the artist. That's why artists get managers because record labels don't want to deal directly with artists. It's all about having that standard of business. They don't want to be liable. They don't want to just, you know, deal with the emotions from an artist because they're crazy. And it, it sucks. And on top of that, the RIAA is retarded. I don't know any better term for it. If, that was the, if, that, if that's what the R stood for in their name, I wouldn't be surprised. They literally just have been making mistake after mistake after mistake from suing little kids for downloading to pushing, you know, the um, the Internet Protection Act, which we'll probably, I don't know, we're going to talk about. Um, and just, I don't know, they they are just they are just in it to protect record labels, to keep them from sinking. They're like the government bailout for record labels. Um, and it's, and I think they're failing in every sense of the term, especially in this internet age when artists don't really need record labels anymore. So that is my stance. I mean, it's, it, it's kind of confusing because when I first heard about it, I was like, there's no way this is real. This has got to be a joke. Like, why are people talking about this? There's no way this is real. Because it would almost just seem like if, if that were to happen, so many websites would just be shut down that are actually legitimate. So many videos on YouTube would be taken off. And to, I don't know how many people would go to jail. It's like, that's like the... That's what is that? There's no way that could actually be passed. Why would they even consider that? And if anything, all the covers and the remixes and the you know people uploading on the internet has only brought more fame and marketing and promoting towards these artists because the best way, the be the most effective way of marketing is through word of mouth and literally just stumbling upon something that you find beautiful um, rather than it being pushed in your face. So it, it doesn't make any sense to me that this act would even go through. It's like, what, what, you know, that would just completely turn the internet upside down. And it would, it would just cause chaos. It's like, why would, why would anyone even think of doing that? I think it's literally, if that act is passed, A, I would be done. I would be finished. And I'd have to take down every single video on my YouTube. That's also obviously I have an interest in this, and if people and I would go to jail or something. And I remember even seeing the interview with Justin Bieber, and they asked him like, "What do you think of this act?" Because you know, you know, you are, got famous off of covering big artists. You um, have millions of fans singing your songs as well, and he even said um, that that. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. What kind of act is this? Whoever whoever's thinking of passing this needs to be jailed. Like they need to go to jail, because I I wouldn't be here at all if, if it wasn't for the you know the, the freedom of, of speech and the ability to to make remixes and covers and whatnot and just upload it freely without any consequence. Because obviously there's no malintention involved, and it's just I honestly it's just another ploy to make money. I mean, with the economy going down, the when like New York City passed like all these different like laws to to ticket people, and they're kind of ridiculous. And I think this is the same thing. It's like, oh, we need to think of a law so that we can make money, and that's pretty much what it is. Because oh my God, we're not making any money. We need to make a law though, so we can make some money. Because obviously, someone's going to be making money if everyone's going to jail. 
and people have to start paying to put up a cover or a remix. Um, it, I mean, it, it's yeah, it's like when when all the oil companies wanted to lobby for getting rid of the electric car. Oh, we need a we need to think of a law so we can keep making money and not go out of business. Let's put out the electric. Let's just try to get rid of the electric car. Same thing. It's it's no different. Um, it's it's ridiculous, and I don't. I I if this act were to pass, I could imagine a huge uproar going on that would be worse than the Occupy movement. Because then it's like, oh well, my God, I can't make music anymore. Well, I'm gonna go join the Occupy movement too. Because I'm pissed off. So I can imagine that taking off and just, it would be awful. And I was going to say something else. Yeah, I, I, I do not support it whatsoever and I doubt it's actually going through. And I'm just surprised at how often it's not even covered by like major news outlets. And I'm pretty sure that's for a reason so that, you know, people will, won't know how ridiculous that act would be. Which is, that's why I couldn't believe it. I'm like, how, why do I keep reading these on blogs, but I haven't heard anything about it, like, on major news sources or any of that matter? That's what I am so confused about. And it's obviously making everyone conspire, and it's, it's like, oh my god, it's because of the Illuminati, and they're trying to get us. It's, it's, it's like, <laughs> that's what I, that's why I couldn't believe it. I was like, I was like, this is a joke, right? This has got to be a joke. I've never, why isn't this on CNN? I don't understand. Unless it was, and I didn't hear about it, but usually anything that's big going on, I would hear about it, if it's that big of an issue, which this is. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. It is a good one. I remember for the longest time that I wanted a power that was cool, but it wasn't really that epical. I mean, I don't want to say something really cliche or lame, like, oh, I want to fly or shoot lasers out of my pants. I don't know. I don't want to say anything lame like that just because everyone else says it. But I remember thinking I'd, I'd really like to have the power to just like put my hand over a book and read it, but it's not like I instantly know it. It's like regular reading pace. But I could just like put my hand over it just to like read it at a regular pace. I think that would be cool. I'd be like, oh, I'm, I can read it now um, without even opening it. <laughs> ah, as for superhero name, um, I don't know. I can't think of a good one. I'm not that creative. <laughs> when it comes to superhero names, it's really, really, it's, it's arbitrary. It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, I've written, I wrote one song about a superhero. When I actually, the one I did for the Flux Pavilion remix, I made it about a guy. He's like, he's called the Normalizer, and he like just goes around and just brings, like he just kills people with dubstep bass. And his his arch nemesis was the silencer who only wanted silence and just like that's like that, that was like the only thing I could think of for that remix just because it made sense. Um, but yeah, and uh, I I I remember it wasn't really a superhero, but the one I did for Bass Nectar, I thought of like a robot for Bass Head. I thought of a robot who only runs off of dubstep bass, and but he like lives a normal life like we do. Um, but he's just like, he just goes crazy when the dubstep drop comes in and just like, it's like almost like he's like intoxicated and drunk. That's not really superhero though. That's just, that's just like kind of of the nature, I guess. But I, I can't even, I can't believe I can't think of a, a name for it. Probably, probably someone's going to comment this and be like, oh, your superhero name should be none of that guy for it. Okay. Um, I think... I, I always keep this in mind too. I, there were, I think there were two times that I was recognized on the street. It was when I was talking to my friend Ashley, and her friend Maddie was sitting next to her, who I hadn't met. And she just goes, um, I like talking to Ashley. And Maddie goes, "Are you known like Joshua?" I'm like, "Yes." She's like, "Oh my God, you're like famous." I'm like. 
and this was on my college campus too. This was on my campus, and I was like, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I'm. You can just call me Josh. Uh, you know, it was that was like a weird thing for me. I'd never experienced anything like that, and so that was really, really strange for me. And that, um, and there was like one time I was just like walking on on my campus, past the parking lot. And I don't know who it was, but some random dude just, like, honked at me and, like, waved. And I was like, wait, is that someone I know? Or were they just like, hey, that's Nanai like Joshua? I don't know. I have no idea. That's the only two times I can really think of. Most people are just kind of, like, awkwarded out to, like, approach someone. Because there's, like, another guy on my campus. His name is g Easy. He is, like, really, really big. And... You know, no one just like goes up to him. It's just like, you're like, oh my god, you're too easy. Like, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't bombard him just because he's like, you know, he's just trying to get to class or he's just trying to go study. And so it's the same thing, and that's what also makes me, you know, wonder. Like, I wonder if anyone knows about my music here, or if anyone actually listens to it, because they're not going to just come up to me and like, oh my god, you're not like Joshua. I listen to your music every day, but you know, because we're on the same level. It's like we're, I'm just a student too. I'm just walking around. And so, yeah, and then, and then the only other time I actually knew about that was when I made my presentation in my entrepreneurship class about my music, and some, a, a girl in my class, um, who I never even talked to, um, after I was done with my presentation, she was like, oh, by the way, I like your new YouTube layout. I was like, oh, <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> just random stuff like that, because people don't just come up to me and tell me stuff like that. So... Yeah, I would say two times, and then, and then the only other time was when this rapper I worked with in New York, he was um, talking to his roommate, and he's like, yeah, I was working with None Like Joshua, and his roommate was like, you know None Like Joshua? So, that was the only other, that was the only time I was like, whoa, I don't know, I didn't even know I had fans in New York. So, yeah, that was cool. Those are the only times I've ever really experienced. That's about it. <laughs> Oh man, I was just thinking about this last night. I always update my like Twitter list of artists that I want to collaborate with. And I know I'd want to collaborate with a lot of the indie rappers I was influenced by, like Sage Francis, Buck Sixty Five, um God, who else? Atmosphere. That would be sick. Just yeah, uh POS, Doomtree in general. I, I mean, I'm, I was, my, my lyrics were, were very influenced by those people, and I would love to collaborate them. But I also would love to collaborate with, like, like I feel like I got into music just so I could possibly collaborate with all the, like, bands and artists that I, like, grew up with when I was, like, a little kid. Like, I would love to make a track with Backstreet Boys. I think that would be sick. Like, Backstreet Boys over Dubstep, that would be awesome. I wouldn't care. I think that would be sweet. Or, like, Sarah McLachlan. I would love to do a track with Sarah McLachlan. That would be so sick. Um, let's see who else. Nico Case. She wasn't one I grew up with, but she is, like, a really, really awesome singer, and I would love to do a track with her. Um, Regina Spector would be awesome. A lot of the big, like, indie singer-songwriters I would love to collaborate with. I don't know. Like, I can't... I like collaborating with people that you wouldn't think would ever be on an electronic track and with hip hop. That's what I want to do. Or uh, Savage Garden. Do you know how sick it would be to have Savage Garden on a track? That would be awesome. It wouldn't make any sense, but it would be really, really cool, and it would just like satisfy my childhood dreams. So, I mean, you know what? You know, you know the, the writers for Aqua Teen Hunger Force. I've actually met one of them. I met the main writer. And he said, you know, the, re the only reason I really got into animating was because, you know, I really wanted it to get really big. And eventually I could, like, feature all my favorite bands and artists on the show. Which he does. <laughs> yeah. He brought MC Chris. He got Mastodon. Um, he gets, like, all these, like, random bands from Atlanta, which is where I'm from. And that's where they're, like, headquartered. And he just gets all these random bands that were based in Atlanta to just come on the show and, and like, participate as a character. And that's the only reason why. He just wants to hang out with his favorite bands. Which I think is pretty awesome. So it's like, I feel like, in a way, I wanted to get into music, so perhaps one day I could do the same thing and just, like, collaborate with my favorite artists of all time. Emojin Heat. That would probably be my biggest, most awesome 
collaboration that I would want to do. I don't even know if it's ever going to happen, but that would be nuts. <laughs> Um, that is a little under wraps. I quit doing some local shows just so I could focus on, you know, putting out a lot of tracks on the internet. But next spring, I am hoping to do some shows. And what's in the talks right now is possibly working with some other companies on that. But that is all I will say. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we will definitely think about it. I mean, if it if it goes through, though, I will I will definitely let people know. So right now, it's just it, it's pending. It's very pending. I can't promise anything, but it is pending. Thirty years. Oh my God. I'll hopefully not dead. Um, let's see. I've always wanted to be a teacher. When I'm like 50 years old, and let's say I just I you know was able to run a very successful music enterprise, I would love to teach after that, and just like work at a university or even just volunteer to just like teach music business. I don't know what the model of music business is going to be by then. It's probably going to be like. Oh yeah! Now you can just step into the video game you're playing and listen to music. I don't know. I don't. Or, or yeah, you put on these virtual goggles and you can be in the world of music and just swim around and buy it. I don't know what it's gonna be. Oh yeah, you just put your MP3 player in your robot and it automatically downloads it. But in 30 years, yeah, that, I would love to be able to like teach music business and um, just kind of help like kids get into it and understand it. Because I remember growing up not knowing anything about the music business, and I feel like if I did, I would get way more of a, I would have more of a leg up. So I, I, I want to teach that entrepreneurial sense of being able to just make and create and be able to thrive on your own music, even for like the younger, even younger than college generations. Because I, you know, I know kids that are like nine years old that want to get into making music and create a business. And when you're nine, that's really, it's hard to just understand where to go and who to talk to. So that would be something I would probably want to do when I'm, you know, 50 years old, decrepit, and um, it's, it's probably senile at that point. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I, if I get, when I get really old, I'm not gonna even, like, I, I'm not, I'm not gonna actually, like, be sane. Not purposely, like, like I want to actually just pretend I'm senile just so I can get away with so much stuff and because I'm going to be a bored senior citizen. So I'm just going to like be like just messing with strangers all the time and just like walking around with my pants down and like no one's, oh, he's just senile. But in, like, in essence, I'm actually just like faking it just so I can like, you know, just for shits and giggles and I can just come home and be like, oh, you won't believe what I did today. So, yeah. or just like steal stuff. Just like steal so much stuff, and I'm just give it. Like, oh, he's old. He doesn't know what's going on. Like, oh wow, look at this pot of flowers. But it's like, you know, it's just like it's like one of my books that I really wanted or something like that. And I just <laughs> just, just let him have it. He's old. He doesn't know what's going on. Oh, freestyle rapper Gizmo Fusion. Um. Okay, let me think. Let me think. Okay. Yo, it's Gizmo Fusion. Mashable can't even get those views in. From the high tech to the techno music. How do you work this? It's so confusing. Uh, <laughs> youthful users utilizing the useless. You pick the gadgets, but it won't do shit. Um, see, foolish and stupid. I don't bet on losing as long as I am reading Gizmo Fusion. <laughs> That'll be nine ninety nine. dollars Yeah, you have to get an aggregator and you can like clear the publishing rights to upload that. And it's, I've already copyrighted it, so it's okay. probably going to have a DRM. Maybe someone's going to remix it and I'll probably, we could probably put that as an intro for the uh, video or something like that. And, um, you know, yeah. 
I'll, I'll, I'll need a synchro- I'll need a synchronization fee for you to sign a uh, publishing and licensing contract on that. So, sound good. <laughs> Something that's for sure Watch it go Climbing up Rising sky that's tight as fuck It's wobbly a little bit Nothing we're not managing Everyone will stand in awe Until it starts to fall Fuck!